Hi, and welcome back to the Coalition for Marriage YouTube channel. Uh, for those who are joining us for the first time, well, we are the UK's leading pro-marriage organisation representing tens of thousands of individuals and groups who support man-woman marriage as the only definition of marriage. Other things, of course, take place in a liberal democracy, but uh, we believe that uh, marriage is the term that describes what only a man and a woman can do. And all the secular evidence base seems to indicate that that brings about something special in society that no other relationship type can replicate. It brings about the best version of the next generation, etc., etc. It's a question, of course, which is uh, being struggled with by uh, lots of different types of churches, no less than the Church of England, uh, whose General Synod met very recently. Uh, and somebody who is very involved with Synod uh, sits on the Archbishop's Council, somebody who's a theologian, an academic, um, a wonderful speaker and a gifted intellectual. Reverend Dr. Ian Paul, it's a real joy to talk to you again. Would you like just first of all say hi to our listeners and our viewers? Yes, very good to see you. Thank you very much, Tony. Good to be with you too. Absolute pleasure. Now, I'm just curious, we're catching up, of course, on what happened in Synod last week. Um, and in one sense, it's really, really easy, the conversation. In another sense, having read your blogs and, and lots of other issues and books and posts, it's really, really complicated. But perhaps we could just start off before we get into what happened last week. Simple question. Um, is homosexual sex a sin, according to the church? Uh, well, the answer is um, yes, but I put it more broadly, which is that, uh, um, and more positively as well, which is that um, the doctrine of the Church of England uh, is set out in Canon B30. Now, I think your viewers might be sort of wondering why we're talking about canon law and, and why is it so formal? And the answer is that the Church of England is Protestant and Reformed, and it's also established by law. Now, what that means is that because we're established by law, it means that our doctrines are articulated in our canonical statements. And canon law, because we're established, is actually law of the land. So people, some people say, well, the law of the land says this, but the church says the other. No, actually, for the Church of England, its doctrine, which is in canon law, is part of the law of the land. And that's worth noting, isn't it? Because a lot of the discussion last week was actually about what's the legal advice around these issues. It, it, exactly so. And the, and the re, well, just the, the canon B30... Uh, the canons are in three sections, A, B, and C. Canon B30 says that marriage is, according to the teaching of our Lord, a lifelong union, an exclusive union between one man and one woman. So it is interesting that the Church of England's doctrine is actually very clearly articulated. And the second, the thing I think is really fascinating about that is that the Church of England's doctrine explicitly says that we believe this because we believe this is the teaching of Jesus. So quite a lot of the debates I have discussing with people say, oh, it's all about text in Leviticus or it's all about this. It says, no, it's, it's, it's the teaching of Jesus about, about marriage, which is pretty clear and consistent. And in fact, that has been actually tested in law. A few years ago, there was an employment appeal tribunal case. And, and the judge said, yes, the church's doctrine is clear, is robust and can be appealed to legally. Now, the interesting thing in terms of process is that you can't just make things up in law. <laughs> law, law. Law has to be consistent and coherent and clear. And actually, that's quite a good test for us. And so, as you say, one of the debates in Synod was, what's the legal advice being? Because the fact that we're embedded in that legal process means that we can't do, for example, what the Methodists have done. Methodists last year said, they've agreed to believe two contradictory doctrines of marriage. Now, that can't stand up in law, and therefore the Church of England can't do that. So it's actually quite quite a good test for us. And so in terms of what I think is going on, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, so people are saying, OK, we get that. So what we'd like to be able to do is find two people who are who may or may not be in a... In a, a, a uh, same-sex physical relationship we're not going to ask that question but we're going to bless what's good about those two people together irrespective of whether they may or may not be and so I think that seems to be what's what's happening and what as far as I know they've now agreed to to try out in practice well and that has a number of complications to it um i didn't actually answer your initial question which is this same with homosexual sex <laughs> sin i wanted to be more positive and say this is what the church believes about marriage yeah okay and and the question the question is for us practically and pastorally is do we have confidence in the teaching of jesus because one of the one of the dynamics that happened in sin was people saying well the doctrine says this but actually pastorally we want to do that and my observation, actually, in the debate in Synod, one of, one of my speeches, I simply said, well, hang on a second, who, who is Jesus for us? So on the one hand, 
the one of the things that the New Testament says is that Jesus is our pastor. He is the great shepherd of the sheep. He's the one we look to as the shepherd mm -hmm. and, and, and all ministry, all shepherding ministry, all pastoral ministry looks to Jesus for, for, for our lead and for our example. But on the other hand, the, the title that people use of Jesus most commonly in the New Testament when they're addressing him is teacher. So for Jesus, he teaches as a pastor. You know, there's, there's an incredible moment in Mark's gospel where it, where it says Jesus saw the people and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And therefore he, well, he taught them because Jesus is teaching Jesus's words of life. And, and you know, um, the disciple Peter says this to him in John 6, said, where will we go? Your words are, are eternal life to us. You're our teacher. So the idea that we can separate teaching from pastoral care um, is a bit of a non sequitur. And we're trying to, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to divide and putting asunder what God has joined together. And we shouldn't do that. And actually our, our doctrine needs to, needs to care for people, but our caring needs to be rooted in our teaching understanding. Now the doctrine of the church of England, and this has been tested again in Synod, and we question again and again, is not only that marriage is between one man, one man and one woman, but that that is the only appropriate place for sexual intimacy. Yep. Now that means that's not particularly focused on the whole debate about same sex marriage. That's about all issues i mean you know as 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 you and i've talked about in the past uh casual sex um promiscuity but also cohabitation so se a sexual relationship outside a, a covenant commitment of marriage actually is not good for people jesus's teaching is indeed caring for people you know children raised in a marry in a stable marriage do much better in every every way so so our question really is you know, do we do we have confidence in the teaching of Jesus and Jesus being our pastor and teaching us what is good for us, what is best for us? Now, what we're trying to do is in the Church of England, we're trying to square square a circle, uh, and 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 what people want to do is to say, how can we have the maximum pastoral encouraging response to people and in this particular case the question is two people in a same sex relationship but of course it applies to anybody who comes through our doors whether they're in a cohabitation or whether in, in in casual relationships or whether they've experienced sexual abuse or whatever it is we want to be maximally pastorally responsive to them so in principle the idea that we want to bless what is good in people's lives i would say our men and our men to that of course we want yes. to do that yeah. of course we want to say but we also alongside that for all of us, we're called, Jesus' first call in the Gospels as he goes out and starts his preaching ministry is that the kingdom of God is at hand, that, you know, the longed for presence of God amongst his people to redeem, transform, renew them is coming, is, is, is right, right at hand, right close by. Mm -hmm. How do we engage with that? We need to repent and believe. We need to turn from what is wrong and we need to receive God's grace as we receive his forgiveness and the, and, and the gift of new life. So we do want to bless what's, God, what's good in people's lives. But we also want to call them to the pattern of life that Jesus calls them to, which we know is going to be costly, but it's also going to be the best for them. Now, the question is, can you do that in a sense of, can you have authorized formal prayers to do that? What do they have to say? And this legal constraint comes into bite because, because the doctrine of the church is so clear, the bishops cannot do anything, which is, and this is the technical phrase, uh, contrary to or indicative of a departure from the doctrine of the church. So how do you have any kind of formal welcome to somebody in a same-sex relationship which is not indicative of any change of doctrine? And that's the circle we're trying to square. And the question is, is it possible? Yeah. And what I found interesting was uh, among the range of speakers, and that massive range of speakers, as you would expect, um, there were some who were saying, well, look, um, I'm in a same-sex relationship uh, openly, uh, I'm a member of the clergy and actually I've been blessing other people in same-sex relationships for years and no one's done anything about it. Uh, and you kind of think, well, is this a battle that was actually lost a long time ago? And the answer is yes and no. Um, one of the phrases that the Bishop of London has been using is that we're in a time of uncertainty. And my question repeatedly is, what's uncertain? What, what, what are we uncertain about? The doctrine of the church is not uncertain. It's absolutely clear. Um, what clergy, both parochial clergy, priests and bishops are obliged to do is not unclear. You know, we we made ordination, we took ordination vows and our vows said 
asked, we were asked in public, do you believe the doctrine of the church or do you believe the doctrine of the Christian faith as the church of England has received it? This isn't, this isn't a church of England thing. This is a, this is a, this is a thing of the church Catholic. That is, you know, what, what Christians in all ages and all places and all traditions have always believed that marriage is a covenantal creation relationship between one man and one woman. Do we believe that as the church of England has received it? Yes, we do. Will you uphold this? Will you teach and expound it? By the help of God, I will. Those are vows we all made. So the, the question is, why is there uncertainty? And I think the example you've given gives us a clue, which is that the Church of England, whenever whenever, whenever things have varied uh, in practice, uh, whenever we've shifted ground to the Church, the Church has gone through all sorts, the Church has gone through all sorts of different periods and different uh, different priorities and so on. That's always happened by people varying away from either being closer to or further from the actual doctrine of the church as we formally agreed it. And of course, we live in an age where tolerance is the great virtue. And so, you know, if somebody's in a relationship which is outside the doctrine of the church, well, we don't want to be mean. We don't want to interrogate them. We don't want to make them feel embarrassed. We don't want to be exclusive. So effectively, what happened is that those responsible for discipline of the church, the bishops and for teaching, have just turned a blind eye. So we've ended up in a church where some people do uphold and do believe the doctrine of the church and uphold that and others don't and that's very difficult and you know bishops are, are, are told that they're supposed to be um uh, the 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 focus of unity in a diocese how do you function as a focus of unity when there are some clergy who are upholding the doctrine of the church and some people some clergy who aren't and realistically if you're a bishop you can't just sort of sack half your clergy overnight <laughs> so we've got ourselves into a, a fix over a long long time and that's why i think we're not going to get out of that fix immediately either i think it's going to take a whole generation of turnover of clergy before we are in a sort of stable settled situation again can i pick up on that uh, issue of unity because mm. that, that was raised several times yes it was and i'm curious what is unity what what, what unites if you like unity in what that's the key question i think tony that's a really good question and it's it's unity it's unity in what and unity how do you how do you get to unity mm and um and unity with whom so i just read this morning of an address by a diocesan bishop uh, which was written up it was addressed to the the um, diocesan synod and this bishop said we must not succumb to the temptation for schism now that again that word came up several times in the debate in synod mm -hmm. the problem is that that bishop and the bishops in debate in synod were using the word schism to mean we mustn't divide ourselves as an institution and in particular, that means that we bishops have decided we're going to go in this direction. You are not allowed to challenge that. If you challenge that, we're going to play the schism card. So you're being divisive. But hang on, hang on a second. <laughs> the word schism in relation to Christian unity doesn't apply to institutions. It applies to the church Catholic. And this is an issue that the reformers took very seriously. The reformers did not want to be accused of schism. So they bent over backwards to say, we are not creating schism. What we're doing is we're in line with the, the, the early church, with the fathers, with the, with the, with the new teaching of the New Testament. If you've drifted away from that, they were saying to the, the Roman Catholic Church, you're the one that's created schism because you've, you've divided yourselves from the apostolic teachings. Of course, we believe in the creeds. We are part of the one holy Catholic and apostolic church and that's been really important as reformed churches to say that's what the church of england says we are part of the catholos according to what has always been believed everywhere in every place by every tradition uh, and that means that it, it actually bishops who are wanting to change the doctrine of marriage that we have actually are the ones who are causing schism and therefore to be non-schismatic we want to say you know we're 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 staying with that universal understanding of the church that clear teaching of jesus the consistent message of scripture what, what i find fascinating i think we've talked about this before is that you know my area is in, is, is a new testament scholarship I, my specialism is a book of revelation but i also teach a lot on the, on the on paul and also on the gospels and what i find really fascinating is that when you look at in the academic world and you look at biblical scholarship which, you know much of which is critical liberal scholarship Almost every single reputable biblical scholar, regardless of their own convictions and traditions, say the Bible message is absolutely clear and consistent. Mm. Uh, and uh, that the, the same-sex sexual relationships of any form are rejected. Why? Because in the biblical narrative, same-sex sexual relationships are a rejection of God's creation of male and female. Yeah. And and therefore, in that sense, a rejection of of, of God as creator. And I just read, read a quotation, uh, just uh, somebody passed to me yesterday 
from uh, Louis Crompton, who is a pro-gay um, uh, historian who's written a very challenging history of the way in which the churches down the ages have actually marginalised and persecuted gay people. But in amongst that, he says, it's simply implausible to argue that Jesus or Paul or any other writers in scripture would have accepted same-sex relationships if they were loving and faithful. He says that's not the issue. The issue is not whether the relationships are abusive or loving and faithful. The issue is that same-sex sexual relationships in and of themselves are, are a rejection of our, of our bodily forms given to us as a good gift by God. Mm. So this is someone who, you know, amongst all the other, I mean, I've got an article on my website where I quote scholars who are who think that the church's doctrine is wrong, but they're very clear that that is the doctrine of Scripture. And they say, well, that's fine, but scripture is wrong on this. And therefore, churches ought to reject that, that teaching. Now, of course, the Church of England, again, canon law says our doctrine, canon A5, our doctrine is found, grounded in the scriptures, and is in particular articulated in the form of the church, the Book of Common Prayer and the 39 Articles. And that does make us as a church constitutionally very conservative. So it's very difficult for me to see how the Church of England is ever going, ever going to change its doctrine on marriage. So we, all this pain and all this struggle and this debate, it seems to me, is is actually fruitless to no end. It, we, we, will, we will not ever deliver what those wanting change in the church uh, desire. But they'll just carry on and do it anyway. The, the difficulty is they can't because <laughs> bishops in the Church of England do not have the power. We do not have many popes. Bishops in the Church of England do not legally or constitutionally have the power to declare UDI. They are accountable because we're a church established by law. And this was tested a few years ago in a case in my diocese, Pemberton versus Inwood, where Jeremy Pemberton had married his same-sex partner and was refused a license. And he took the bishop to court. And the, and the bishop said, the judge said, the doctrine, the doctrine is clear. And it means that regardless of what any other bishops do, any bishop can still appeal to that and can still discipline their clergy. So if if bishops do do that, then I think we're going to get into trouble. And of course, the, the the real thing we don't want to do is get into a legal battle because that's that's never going to be fruitful. But what what do you do if the bishops of the church have decided to act contrary to the law, contrary to legal advice? I, I think well, that, it, it takes us. Question, in, isn't it? it takes us. It takes us in a very difficult place. And and the real difficulty is it's massively damaging to confidence. Um, and the Church of England is one of the churches in the UK which has not bounced back from from, from the COVID um, mm. trauma. Mm. Other churches have, and we haven't. And at the moment, the decline in our attendance is continuing. Mm. And as a member of the Archbishop's Council, I'm very concerned about that because we've got specific objectives to turn around that decline, mm. to mm. see young people come to faith, to see churches, pl new churches planted, new churches growing. Mm. But the problem is this debate is actually disenfranchising all those people we need to keep on board who are church planting and evangelizing and all that sort of thing. And they, they're going, mm. you know, people are going to, people who want to see vibrant churches grow are going to be looking elsewhere than the Church of England. And, and that's the big thing, isn't it? The mission of the yeah. church is being affected yeah. by a discussion which, in all honesty, affects a tiny number of people um, who, who, deserve love and respect yeah. as individuals of course they do yeah. um, but that's separate from whether the church should change its doctrine or, or entertain other things which for for millennia it, mm. it has not done so mm. it's a mm. separate conversation and the whole thing is being very distracting and and, and really it, undermining what the church is there for. It, it is and tony what, what i find really fascinating and again i've just had some debates online about this in the last 24 hours is that very often uh we find i find that in in conversation with other people this is a really really key and important pastoral question but underlying that is a bigger question and that is how do we know god's intention for our lives at all how do how do we know can we can we say anything with confidence can we say this is god's intention for us now again the church of england formally says yes we can and it says the primary way we do that and the way which is ultimately gives us clarity about God's intention for us is by the right interpretation of Scripture. And what I find uh, very quickly in discussions about this, I very quickly get into the question, well, what does the Bible say? Is the Old Testament relevant to us? I mean, somebody said to me yesterday, well, Jesus came along and started, uh, invented a new religion. Oh, so and I go, well, ha well, ha well, hang on a second. Yes. That's not what the New yeah. Testament says. The New mm -hmm. Testament says... As we say in the creeds, that Jesus died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. Well, the scriptures it was in accordance with, of course, there must for Paul have been the Old Testament scriptures. And every single uh, gospel, all of Paul's writings repeatedly say 
Jesus is the Jewish Messiah who fulfilled God's promises in the Old Testament and completed them, but actually made that salvation available to Gentiles as well. We Gentiles are grafted in to the olive tree that is the Israel of God. And we part of that. So this does raise some pretty big questions about how we read scripture at all and how we understand. And in one way, one thing that's good is coming out of this is people are thinking, saying, actually, we need to think rather more carefully about how we how we read scripture and how we make sense of it the message for the woman caught in adultery was of course you know go away and and, and sin no more um so it wasn't that she was rejected for what she'd done but uh, recognized and encouraged to put it behind her that, that does that does sharpen the pastoral challenge because i there is still the the real challenge as to how hospitable we are as churches to gay people who come to us but but not 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 just that but i think that there has been I think for evangelical churches, there's been um, a tendency still to appeal to those who are more respectable. And, you know, one of the one of the constant challenges to us is, is can we offer people the hospitality that Jesus did? So n- as far as I can read in the Gospels, no one ever felt put off by coming into Jesus's company because they felt unworthy or because because they, they he wouldn't he wouldn't bring healing to their woundedness. And and we've, we we still have a constant pastoral challenge. in in our local churches to make sure we are we we aren't simply saying to people you've got to live a good life or this is a place for whole people but actually you know being a place for people who are uh, wounded or broken who 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 need to change who need to move on so are there any or or is it not a relevant question are are there any red lines oh yes very clearly i mean i'd say the same thing that john stott said a generation ago which is that um i mean here's two things one is that uh, the church blessing same-sex marriages or same-sex sexual relationships is a red line because it's so contrary to the clear teaching of Jesus. But he also had an interesting qualification to that, which is to say the fact that many people in the church would con- do, do things contrary to the teaching of Jesus and contrary to the teach- teaching of Scripture is not in itself a red line. The red line is when that becomes embedded systematically in the church because as long as there's a space in any denomination for... Um, for evangelical, for orthodox, for biblical witness and practice, then then that institution is redeemable. Mm-hmm. The line is crossed when there's a formal change, which would then lead to it being impossible for orthodox ministry to continue. So as long as the doctrine of the church is clear in, in B30, and, and what's interesting is that even those wanting change in practice are quite clear that the doctrine of marriage is not going to change any, in any time soon, and, and there simply isn't the will to do that. And as long as that's the case, I'm very happy to be at home and to be ministering in the Reformed and Protestant Church, which is the Church of England, part of the Church Catholic. Uh, and and the other thing I keep wanting to say to people is, look, all these debates are happening up in Synod and up here and bishops doing this and that and the other. Actually, on the ground out there, in many Church of England churches, as, long as, as well as other denominations, there are churches which are growing and thriving, seeing people come to faith, seeing lives transformed, seeing young people discover the good news for themselves. And, and in, in here, where I'm in Nottingham, there are a good number of thriving churches. And again, people people look at the Church of England statistics, go gloom and doom, we're a post-Christian country and all that kind of thing. In the last five years, the evidence, research evidence shows that the church, the church, the Christian church in England and Wales is not in decline. The Church of England might be in decline, but other churches are growing. And overall, we're not in decline. And, and we want to be encouraged. Yeah. So can I, just to clarify that, so you're saying even if uh, they have effectively already said they're going to pursue blessing of um, same-sex unions... Um, or prayers of blessing because they're going to try them out and it's very unlikely they're going to withdraw them or, or restrict them it'll be expanded as as these things often happen but you're saying as long as it isn't the case that uh a you're forced to do it or told you have to do it or, or b that you're you're told you cannot do uh the alternative which is you know only bless whichever of those two that would then be the red line the fact that it's taking place uh, and and officiated and accepted and institutionalized that in itself is not a red line no it because in the end uh what i took ordination vows to do was to uphold the doctrine of the church as expressed in canon law and in the book of common prayer and the articles that's 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 what i've committed to do but i also i'd also qualify that and say synod did not agree to to pass these things what synod said i've got the wording here in front of me is that 
the Synod has asked the House of Bishops to consider whether some standalone services for same-sex couples could be made available for use, possibly on a trial basis. So it's all hedged around with ifs and buts. And as far as I understand the legal advice, that's simply not going to be possible. It's oh, not right. Possible. So you still think it's going to be scuppered by the legal advice? Yes, yeah, it is, because right. nothing can be authorised which is indicative of a departure from the doctrine yeah. of the church. Yeah. So yeah. any, if you have a service which says, we're going to bless this couple, for it not to be indicative of a departure from the doctrine of the church, it's going to have to clarify the doctrine of the church as marriage between one man and one woman and be clear that this service is not a quasi-marriage. Now, that's if you have that, is anybody going to want to use that? Yeah, 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 that's right. But, and that's but the legal when, guidance we had quite clearly when we, when we, at the end of the last process in 2017. And yeah. there's no obvious reason in law. When you and others, when you and others asked for the legal guidance at Synod, you received the response, well, you've, you've had it. It's there in front of you. The documents you've but got it, are but based it wasn't. on the legal guidance. And it wasn't. Um, no. In fact, the, the, the bishop's own paper said, it would be very difficult, I use a triple negative, it would be very difficult in a service for it not to be suggestive of a departure from the doctrine of church unless it was clear what the status of the couple was. So in their own paper, they've admitted that there's a, there are huge legal problems for this. And until that legal advice is published, we, we just don't know. So as far as you're concerned, it's all still in play. The doctrine of the church has not changed. Yeah. No liturgy has been commended or yeah. authorised. And so we're no, we're no, we're no further on now, actually, than we were in 2017 <laughs> at the end of the uh, previous process of shared conversation. Oh boy! Well, and, and we'll all the back. all the change, I'm afraid, it is the propaganda, and it's in the news yeah. media, and it's just not accurate. It's just not true. The main, even the main headline from the Church of England Commons was not true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what what are you not talking about while Synod is consumed with these things? That's the other <laughs> thing as well. You know. Well. <laughs> We, we're we not talking about clergy pay and pensions, which is a big thing of mine. Uh, the, our clergy uh, pension, uh, pay, stipends have gone down in real terms over the last 10 years and in comparison with other pay. And, I, and I, I've got a private member's motion, uh, which is going to address that. And the clergy pension was cut by a third. And that's not good. I think we've got issues around deployment. Uh, I think we've we've got a serious issue around our theological education, and that needs to be reviewed. And that's something I'm pressing on Archbishop's Council. Uh, we really want to engage with young people. Lots of churches are doing great things with young people. We have actually invested in a partnership with Youthscape, which I think is, is going to be really good in piloting work and in helping churches engage with young people uh, and, and giving people confidence. Our, our, our diocese has just shifted their, their new set of goals. We want to see people have confidence in their Christian faith, have compassion as they as they share that with people in practical ways, but also have courage to stand up and to be confident Christians in a culture where actually that's that's quite difficult. And for me personally, you know, I'm I'm not an evangelist, but I know the work of evangelism needs to be done. Uh, when I was in the best, the best moment for me in general synod, as is often the case, was I, there was a, a busker playing in the underground, playing beautiful um, a, a Bach violin concerto. And I stopped and said, that's wonderful. That's really life giving. And he said, yes, well, you know, everyone just needs to, to be able to attain their goals. And I said, yeah, well, the difficulty is we, there are all sorts of things that constrain us from doing that. But the really good news is that Jesus' death on the cross has defeated all those things and his resurrection gives us new life. And as long as I got the chance to say that to people and share that good news, then that I'm, you know, I'm in business. <laughs> Yeah, and oh, that's marvellous. And you've, I, I want to recommend people go and read your blog. Because oh, do. Yes, you, thank you. Yes. You, yes. You, no, and we'll, we'll put the address up on the screen. Thank you. Um, yes. And it is. I love the way your 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 uh, math, the mathematician comes out in you, the way you do it. It does, I'm afraid. Sensibly, yeah. logically. Yeah. You break it down to its simple components. Yeah. Uh, and today, today's sort of... article I posted is, a, is I post every year at this time, which is to just remind yeah. people yeah. that nowhere in the New Testament does it say that Jesus was born in a stable. In fact, he was born in a in the the main room of a loving family home. And Jesus comes not to be out there in the margin to be lonely for us to be sorry, but he comes his his life comes into the midst of the busyness of our homes and our lives to change and transform us right where we are. Great, Doctor Ian Paul, what a joy to talk to you. Great to talk to you, Tony. Thank you.